Well, it's 12 p.m. here in California. Yeah, we're, we're, just... we're letting participants come in and starting our webinar in yeah. just a few seconds. So. so for those of you who are already here, welcome to Zooming In, our weekly curatorial conversations. I'm Shir Galkojavi, Assistant Curator at the Magnus, and with me is Francesco Spagnolo, Head Curator. Hi, Francesco. Hi, Shir. Welcome back. Yes, uh, thank really you. It's nice to week. see you. Mm -hmm. well, Luckily, I was able to, to be a viewer <laughs> for last week, um, and I really enjoyed the talk. So thank you for taking over. Um, as a reminder to all our guests today, we'll be presenting for approximately 20 minutes. Um, and just as we do every week, we'll explore an object in our collection and see how it our research really opens up a whole world of interpretation and ideas uh, surrounding this object. Um, we have a few rules of engagement, right? Uh, and sure, you're muted, so uh, unmute yourself so that people can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, too many and, clicking. Uh, yeah, I know you're sharing the screen today, so it's uh, it's on you to play with all of the various settings. Uh, so welcome. <laughs> this is a Zoom webinar, right? Yes, it's a Zoom webinar. So all of our participants' videos are hidden, but you can contact us in two ways. If you have any technical questions, please use the Zoom chat button on the bottom of your screen. Or if you have any questions for us, please use the Q&A button. Um, after 20 minutes of presenting, we're going to leave a few minutes for questions. So please feel free to ask us anything that comes up to your mind. And if you're not sure or have any additional questions afterwards, please feel free to use the uh, email address below and look for more information on our website. As a reminder, the Magnus Collection is one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world. It's one of the top three in the United States and the only Jewish museum collection associated with a major research university. So let us begin. Today, our starting point is the beautiful porcelain set that was created in 1855 to celebrate the wedding of Vissim de Camondo and his wife, Elise Fernandez. Um, We'll get into the rest of the details that you see here later on, but we selected a few topics that we think are interesting to discuss in this context. We'll start by looking at memory objects and exhibition curated last year at our museum, which really uh, looks at the history of, the, of displacement of objects, especially those in our collection. Then we'll move to have a closer look at the Camondo family and their lives in Istanbul and Paris. Um, we'll follow, follow that talk with that quick conversation with the, looking at the Camundo Museum that was open to the public in Paris in 1936 and end with a short epilogue that will allow you, our guests, to hear a little more about the provenance of this spectacular um, porcelain set. So and, with, uh, Shir, we are, we're going this way with one object. We're going to Istanbul, to Paris, and also visiting what we discovered is one of our favorite museums in the world, the Missing de Camondo Museum in Paris. So exactly. it's a way, you know, through these Zoom boxes to actually travel and see the world. Uh, yeah. Who knew? Who that knew? This would happen. <laughs> so please join us for this uh, on this tour. And Francesco, I'd like to invite you to to begin by really walking us through a bit of this of this wonderful exhibit that we had last year at the Magnus. Yes. Uh, so I think we have a few installation images to show. Uh, this is what the gallery looked like. It's the same gallery that's in, in my virtual background, but different color scheme and completely different content. What's on my background is the current exhibition that we hope to reopen as soon as we can, uh, devoted to Arthur Schick and Human Rights. And just before that, in that gallery was installed an exhibition called Memory Objects, Judaica Collections and Global Migrations. Uh, the, the exhibition really focused on uh, uh, one specific collection, the grounding, the founding Judaica collection of the Magnus, it was the Siegfried Strauss, it was a private collection by, uh, collected by a, a gentleman by the name of Siegfried Strauss, co collected mostly in Europe and mostly in the interwar period between World War I and World War II. And uh, we not only explore that, uh, that collection, which is the, the largest, first largest acquisition of Judaica of the Magnus was made in 67, 68. Uh, uh, but also through, through that uh, collection, we really thought a little hard about uh, the origins of Judaica collections. And uh, the fact that many of these collections, private and public, came about because there were a lot of 
small objects. They're sprinkled. If you just, if you can go back for a second and they're sprinkled around the gallery, like a variety of small objects that were available on the, on the art market in the interwar period because refugees were coming to large uh, cities in Europe uh, from uh, the, after the fall of the Russian Empire, the, the Abzko Empire, um, and of course the Ottoman Empire. And they were bringing these objects and dealers were buying them, collectors were buying them, museums were buying them, and collections were formed that way. So it was a way for us to really explore the links between the displacement of people, the displacement of, of objects. And uh, in, in displaying the Strauss collection, we also brought in a, a, a stranger, something that had nothing to do with it, which is this, uh, this set. In fact, we, we repacked it as if it were packed in a crate. And, uh, and it's, uh, well, you're going to tell us everything about this, but this is the wedding set that we're, uh, that we're discussing today uh, that belonged to the Camondo family in Istanbul, arrived to the Magnus in Berkeley through interesting byways, and, and we'll, we'll discuss this, uh, this uh, a little later in our presentation today. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it also had a very important link to multiple layers of dispossession. The, the Camondo family was a fam one of the Jewish collecting families of, of Paris in the early 20th century. We'll talk about it, uh, Shir, you're gonna Briefly. tell pretty much everything about them. Everything uh, in a minute. I yes, will, everything in a minute. I will do my best. Yeah, <laughs> of course. But uh, they, they, they're also featured in a, in a book that's dear to us and to many in our, in our circles. The Hair with Amber Eyes, it's a, it's a 2000 and, uh, uh, and uh, um, what is it? Uh, 10. 2010, uh, yes. Yes, uh, it, 2010 book by, by Edmund Deval, who is a ceramicist and who investigated uh, the dispossession of the art collection of his uh, family, the Afusis, who shared a very similar trajectory uh, with, the, uh, with the Camondo family. And, uh, and, and who, here he is, actually, Edmund Deval. Yes, um, he is with the <laughs> remaining items of his, uh, of his collection. In the exhibition, we also featured new objects that are displaced with refugees in the current refugee crisis, the greatest one since the great one of, uh, after World War I. And as we were installing the exhibition, a news cycle, and I remember this, it was kind of striking, uh, brought to us the news that Edmund de Waal had sold what remaining portion was left of the, of the collection he inherited from his family, which was the last remaining of a much larger art collection that was, uh, that was looted by Nazis. Uh, uh, in the in the 1930s and and 40s and and uh, and he had sold and the proceedings were going to a charity that was uh, helping refugee children and uh, refugee children just just you know by the way are are in the news cycle uh, these days if anybody heard the the, the presidential exactly. debate they were discussed just yeah, last just uh, last, last night, night uh, in front of everybody and uh, and um, so. There, there was a direct link here, and the link is brought through the book. Here is a, just a passage. We are going to quote a couple of passages from this book uh, today. In libraries, Edwin de Waal writes, I stumble across things that lead onwards. Sideways, I am winded to find that Louise Caen d'Anvers house was used by the Nazis as one of their Paris detention camps. It was one of the three annexes of the Drancy concentration camp, where Jewish inmates had to sort, clean, and repair furniture and objects stolen by the Rosen, by Rosenberg organization for the functionaries of the Reich. Then, terribly, there is a note in brackets that the girl in the blue dress in Renard's double portrait of her daughters had been deported and died in Auschwitz. And then, I find that Fanny and Theodore Reinox, who were part of the Camondo family, as we will uh, learn, we'll learn uh, their, their son Leon and his wife, Beatrice Camondo and their two children were deported as well. And uh, we'll learn more about this family and we'll go back to, to Leon Reinach, uh, who was a composer, we're going to listen to some of his music. And let's, uh, let's dive in into, into the history of this incredible family. Thank you, legacy. Francesca. So we're actually practically starting you off from the end because now you know the end, the sad ending of our story. But before that, long before that, we actually uh, are get, going to learn a little bit about this wonderful, wealthy uh, Camundo family that were named the Rothschilds of the East or the Rothschilds of the Ottoman Empire, where they established a bank. Um, and we are really going to look to concentrate specifically on this character in the center of this uh, family tree that I selected here, Nisim de Camundo. And we'll look at his, uh, his son later on who's underneath him. Um, also, interestingly, 
just as an, a wonderful, beautiful example, we found uh, this beautiful uh, wedding ketubah that belonged to his sister, Rebecca, who was created in Turkey in 1849. It belongs to the wonderful Gross family collection. And in Tel Aviv. And in Tel Aviv. Thank, thank you, Bill Gross, for <laughs> yes, sharing thank this image you. with us. And this is really just a, a small example to, of, to show the wealth and the statue of this family. It's a very large ketubah in size. I actually added the size for you to, to see. I prefer the centimeters, but for all of you who prefer inches, it's also here below. And this really shows you how wealthy this banking family here. On the bottom of the ketubah, there are these houses drawn, really houses, typical houses of wealthy families that, were, that actually existed at the time on the Bosphorus. Um, waterway in Turkey. And this is just to show just partially uh, the wealth and the, the status of this, of this unique family and its, uh, and its development. Um, so Nisim de Camondo married Elise Fernandez in 1855, which is the year in which this um, wonderful um, porcelain set was created in Paris. And this was sent to them from Paris to Istanbul. Uh, for their wedding. And as you will see in the few examples that we selected, uh, Nisim's initials, uh, NC, are found on each one of the pieces of this set. So here you find it on the bottom, on the bottom of the three-tiered um, dessert uh, plate platter. Here you see it on this beautiful bowl and on these plates. And then on the back of this plate, I just brought you an example of the, of the stamp of the maker, of course, a Paris maker. Um, um, so just to get back for briefly to give you a bit of, to go back kind of to our macro look at, the, at Paris at the time, since Nisim married Elise um, in 1855, they actually decided to move to Paris um, along with his brother in 1869, just uh, almost uh, just 15, less than 15 years later uh, with their son. And um, they established their, their bank, a branch of their bank in Paris at the time. So they lived in a few places in Paris and they were really surrounded wherever they were with these other very successful, very wealthy Jewish families as the Rothschild. And once again, um, in, this, in this wonderful quote from The Heron with Ember Eyes, um, Edwin Deval mentions these families. So I'll just read this quickly to you. As they walk down the hill from the Hotel of Fossi, I'm conscious that many of the houses I pass have these stories of reinvention embedded in them. Almost everyone who built them started somewhere else. 10 houses down from the Afrusi household at number 61 in the house is the house of Abraham Kamondo with his brother Nisim at 63 and their sister Rebecca at number 60. The Kamondos, Jewish fin financiers, like the Afrusi had come, from, had come to Paris from Constantinople by way of Venice. At number 55 is the Hotel Katai, home to, the family, to a family of Jewish bankers from Egypt. At number 43 is the Palace of Adolf, Adolf de Rothschild. So you see how they were all living in proximity, probably familiar with each other, and probably also familiar with each other's collections, which gets us to our next uh, short theme here. Um, I wanted to bring you an example of a few of these other wealthy collector, Jewish collectors who were living in Paris at the time. And Imagine yourself maybe in these, kind, these beautiful environments, exploring these works of art, exploring these very lavish furniture and uh, in, these, in these beautiful settings. And here we see on the left, uh, Edouard Voyard's beautiful uh, portrait of David, David Weil, who was actually born in San Francisco, uh, but he was a French American banker who moved to Paris uh, in early 19, in the early 1900s and um, established a very, a very large uh, and unique 18th century uh, furniture collection. And as you see in the background of the painting, a beautiful um, painting collection. We also have to the right, a very different type of group of collectors. It's actually another beautiful portrait by Edward Boyard, slightly earlier, of the brothers uh, Jos and Gaston Bernheim Jean, who were uh, the sons of the founder of the Bernheim uh, Gallery, that was established in Paris in 1901 and was dealing with modern artworks until 2019 when it closed. Um, here on the bottom, and you'll see kind of a repetition of this setting later on as we look at the Camondo Museum, is uh, the Hotel Salomon de Rothschild, which I only found an image of this very, very rich interior. Uh, unfortunately, all the artworks have been 
removed because this building is used today for other events. And on the right is a black and white, of course, this collection is in pieces today, unfortunately, is a picture of the interior of the house of Adolf Schloss, who was um, a German Jewish um, um, goods broker who worked for many department stores in Paris at the time. So now we're going back to our story and we're going back to our wonderful Kamunder family. And here we're going to start off with, their, with the son of uh, Nisim and his wife, Elise, who was born in Istanbul and moved to, to uh, Paris uh, in 1869. Moïse married Irene Candenvel. Irene, this is a beautiful, the, her, I, think, I think that family is mostly well known today for the, port, the beautiful portraits of, um, of the, her and her sisters that were painted by Renoir in the late, 19, uh, sorry, in the late uh, 19th century. So here she is next to Moïse. And unfortunately that marriage wasn't very successful and they ended up getting a divorce, but that's all the gossip I'm going to give you about this today. And we're going to move on and concentrate on what happened to the rest of the family. So Moïse and Irene had two, had two children, Nissim and Beatrice. And this is another kind of context image that we found from uh, the Musée d'Art et d'Histoire du Judaism, the, his, the Museum of History and Art of, uh, the Jewish Museum of History and Art in Paris, um, which uh, has a, this clipping from a newspaper in 1911. In the center of it is uh, Suzanne Cremieux, who was later during the Nazi period, uh, saved a lot of children from France who, and was able to ship them into safety outside of, of France, but that's a different story. And she's surrounded by these ladies, these young ladies. One of them is actually this uh, daughter of Moïse and Irene, um, Beatrice, whose story we're really going to get into right now. So Beatrice and her brother Nissim here on the right, uh, the family had a very close relationship. The father and the children had a very close relationship. The mother, unfortunately, was out of the picture after the divorce, and the father really raised the two children. Nisim was drafted to, to the French army for the, for, and participated as a pilot in the French World War and was killed in action in September of 1917. And his devastated father wanted to find a way to commemorate his son. In the meantime, Francesco, I'd like to invite you to join me and celebrate briefly this reunion of, uh, of Beatrice and Leon Reinach. Yeah, well, uh, Leon Reinach, so, you know, the narrative we're exploring is basically these wealthy banker families moved from, from the Ottoman Empire into Paris, uh, added their wealth to the wealth of the city, collected, they all lived around Parc Monceau in, in, in the city of Paris. Many of them, like the Camondo, donated artwork that they had collected to the city of Paris, and this was the secret of uh, a secret move of the Camondo family and the Camondo Museum, but uh, all of their pr private collections were looted. And many of them, like, like Leon Reinach and his wife and children were deported and murdered in, in Nazi extermination camps. In, uh, in, uh, in the early 2000s, actually, a, 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 an Italian novelist, Filippo Tuena, uh, researched the history of the family for a, for a novel. The novel was eventually called The Reinach Variations and discovered all of this. I remember being contacted by him and being in communication with, uh, with him at the time and rediscovered a sonata that had been uh, published in, a very, in very few copies in 1925, uh, written by Leon Reinach. He was, in the, he was in the library of Harvard University. And eventually, following the, the, the publication of the novel, uh, there, was a, there was a recording, the first uh, commercial recording of the sonata. It was performed once in the 50s by Radio France, but uh, uh, who knew about it? It's actually very beautiful and haunting, especially considering it's, it's sort of like a soundtrack to this uh, glorious and tragic history that we're painting today through a small porcelain set.
it's so uh, haunting cute. music huh it's beautiful and uh and now when we know uh the sad ending of this of this family of uh, the whole empire basically in auschwitz in 1944 um we're going to go back uh and look at the commander museum in paris so as I mentioned, Moise tried to find a way to um, commemorate his son who uh, died in serving his, his country uh, during World War I in the scene. Um, and, he, and his way was to donate this beautiful mansion that he, cre that he had in Park Monceau in which he created this, um, this very lavish and very rich um, collection of decorative uh, French art, mostly from 18th century, as you can see by the room that I found an image of here on the bottom of the screen. Um, and, in 19, and he donated it in 1935. Uh, in 1936, the museum was already open to the public. Uh, but of course, uh, once World War II broke in 1940, the museum was closed and all of the objects in the museum were removed to the countryside along with items that belonged to the Louvre Museum. And they returned in 1946 and the museum was reopened to the public then. So the, um, the gift here was to the city of Paris. So this yes. is a museum of the city of Paris, which is why this collection was not looted by the Nazis. Because exactly, it, because it was nationalized, it was essentially. Nazis, yeah. uh, and it became part of the, of the Louvre and the Musée des Arts Décoratifs. Um, and it was basically part of the city, as you said. So Moïse, uh, just to go back to our porcelains, because that was our starting point, Moïse was also a fan of porcelains because they are gorgeous, and unique, and fragile. And how can one not like porcelains? And this is a very um, beautiful set that he collected in two colors, as you see. He has the green and, and the pink. And it's called the Bird Collection de Buffon because it was created by the Sev a porcelain uh, make, maker, um, manufactory outside of Paris in the uh, 18th century. And it was very, very successful up until the French Revolution in the late 18th century. Um, and it was created, it, all of the set has different birds on it. It was created as part of, um, of kind of a reaction to a very successful book about the natural history of birds created at the time by the Comte de Buffon. And that is why it's called that way. So just a fun little story. And of course, one of the favorite sets. And here we, we are to end our story. Um, and it's actually an interesting ending. So when we started looking at this set again and kind of went back to opening up all of our information and all of the information collected by our predecessors at the Magnus uh, Collection, we found a very interesting, um, um, the, very interesting that this collection was actually uh, donated to the Magnus and, uh, by a local collector, but it was, um, Donated also mentioned the name of Hippocrates Papa, Papa Vasilio. Hippocrates Papa Vasilio, after research that included um, you know, research on the continent, off the continent by researchers who speak Greek, who don't speak Greek, who speak Turkish. So this was a fun, fun time. Um, so Hippocrates was, uh, was a lieutenant during the Greek Ottoman War in 1897. In 1897, of course, the commandos were, were uh, out of, out of uh, Istanbul. They moved to Paris. So they must have left a few things behind. And this, uh, the porcelain set that we have today at the Magnus was apparently found by this man who eventually decided to give it to the collector who donated to the, Ma to the Magnus only in the 1990s. Uh, in the meantime, there was a little relationship that was formed between our museum, the Camundo Museum in Paris and the Museum of uh, Jewish History and Art in Paris. And in the late 1990s, two, um, two plates from that set were actually um, given back by the Magnus Collection to these two museums. And now all of us together in Paris and in Berkeley have portions of this wonderful set of the Camundo family. So a set that was uh, created in Paris, brought to Istanbul, then went to Berkeley, then back to Paris. And uh, this is just to show everyone what uh, See, it's seemingly innocent uh, set. I particularly like the, the, the plate for serving desserts, the, the multi-tier <laughs> plate, right? A, a, a set like this, uh, where it can lead us. Uh, mm -hmm. Yet another example of uh, the, the meanderings and the wonders of uh, museum collections, the power of collecting and the power of archives. Thank you, Shir, for Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. This. And uh, listening. it seems like uh, maybe we presented so much information that people are not asking for uh, for other questions. 
Um, and You've overwhelmed uh, them. But, uh, but you can, you know, you, you, still have, you still have a couple of minutes. If you hit the Q&A button at the bottom of, of your screen, you can ask uh, ours, especially Shir, who's done incredible research around this. Um, I think I only found that the Paris connection with the fact that this plate uh, ended up in Paris and I was scratching my head. How did that happen? And also we hope that uh, maybe we should have said at the beginning that uh, people watching from home should have, should have uh, gotten a hold of a graph paper to keep up with all of the family trees that we shared and, and climbing up and down these trees. But it, it is in, an incredible and fascinating and as we saw also haunting story and it's, uh, it's uh, it, it felt appropriate to to the context we put it in in our exhibition uh, on memory object mm -hmm. and it was it was not specific to the collection we're highlighting but uh, as a way to think about how museum and private collections really result from layers of uh, possession and dispossession we have a couple of questions great so and also oh great in. and also we um, think about our responsibility as a museum in terms of the ethics of uh, this so, collection so uh, Con uh, are any contacts with surviving members of the Komondo family? We don't know of any surviving of the Komondo family. As far as, uh, as you know, um, the Komondo family ceased to exist um, after the Holocaust. And uh, we also have a question about if we know, and off the top of my head, I can remember how, how many pieces of the service does the Magnus have? Uh, oh. Well, it's not a full piece. Um, I will need uh, to check. Um, 20, 30, something like that. It's uh, maybe even uh, maybe even more. It's it's a large set, but it's quite it's partial. Complete. Yes. And do we know where Nissim the Commando was buried? He was buried in Paris, but I don't have the name of the cemetery. He was not buried in Père Lachaise, if I if I remember correctly. I can check that, and we can send that information to whoever is interested. That, is def inf that information is definitely available. So we're going to get uh, together. By the way, some of the questions are coming from colleagues from other institutions, etc. So it's actually fun to know that oh, wonderful. Uh, we have an interesting and, and phenomenal follower. So, mm -hmm. so it's, we're going to keep it up. And in fact, we're coming back next week. Next week, And yeah. we have a special guest. Yeah. Um, from another institution, from another a colleague and a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Curator at the Boston Museum of Fine Art, Curator of Judaica, uh, mm -hmm. and we're talking about... Uh, Silence presence, uh, the very interesting, very unique uh, role of um, female representations in synagogue textiles. So where sometimes we don't find the female presence in physical realm, we can find it in other ways. And we'll tell you more about it if you join us next week. So, so I'm thank you, everybody. To you again, Shira, yeah. and spending time with you like every Friday and with, uh, with the people who are following us from home. And yeah. so, yes, thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Nat, for helping us today. Thank you, Nat Constant, for, for helping us and uh, making all the tech magic. Yeah, and have a good weekend, everyone. See Until you next, next week. Bye-bye. Goodbye.